In the midst of distant millennia was built a colossal monument, covered in millions of tiny writings. This structure was the epicenter of global pilgrimage, an architectural legacy of arcane knowledge rooted in a world that no longer exists. This massive corpus of secrets from the archaic past, the present of their world, and the distant future was originally protected by keepers, but they violated their position as guardians of mankind, oppressing humanity until their sovereignty was fractured by an epic cataclysm that entombed the old world. At variance with the Creator, these beings waged a terrible war against Him and the rest of creation. These guardians were among the first created, their intelligence ancient and matched only by their seething hatred they felt for humanity. This animosity toward mankind was pronounced in the court of heaven by the word as blasphemy, for these newly created beings designed to tend and keep his garden were made in his image. The leaders of this angelic insurrection were imprisoned below the earth. They were appointed to watch over, and God led mankind to construct a monument directly over the entrance to this prison, one that would not be opened again until the apocalypse. A stone guardian was sculpted out of the rock of the earth itself to keep watch over this holy monument, and the triangle then became the universal symbol embodying the sacred secrets of this magnificent building. It is the icon of the Arcanum of Mysteries that the Great Pyramid was designed to protect. Though its origin lies in an obscure past, the Great Pyramid's foundation was laid exactly 666 years before a terrifying catastrophe fragmented the entire world, burying hundreds of millions of people and their cities deep below the surface. In a series of meteoric impacts, Tremendous earthquakes, volcanic explosions, and resurfacing of entire buried land masses, lakes and seas slipping from their basins, geologic upheavals, and the bathing of the planet in billions of tons of cosmic dust that rained as mud over land and sea. The marine mesosphere was emptied and collapsed to the ground, this dense atmospheric layer of water raining for weeks and plunging the world into a barren waste of oceans and ice caps. The ancients relate that the Great Pyramid was specifically designed to survive this disaster which had been foretold. Though its presence in the old world presaged death and ruin, it contains within it the beginning of the greatest gift from the Creator. It was sealed in the beginning because its purpose is in the end. This monument is a mine of enigmas, an artifact from a dead world concealing an extinct knowledge we can barely penetrate. It was made marvelously to be an enduring shadow of things to come, an arcane theology and stone that typifies eternal truths and images for the earthly comprehension of men. The secrets of a thousand scriptures are unveiled within its manifold faces, corners, and corridors, a depthless mine of revelations. By intense scrutiny of the mysteries of the Great Pyramid do we approach the arcanum of truth known simply as the Word of God. Long ago, this arcanum walked among men teaching hidden wisdom and the deep knowledge in the form of parables, for parables are images of truth masked in earthly symbols. And the greatest symbol of him on earth is the Great Pyramid, a parable of rock. Even centuries after the Great Deluge, pilgrims traveled from afar to gaze upon the highly polished white surfaces of the Great Pyramid. The learned from scores of cultures visited Egypt to study the ancient antediluvian writings found upon the base casing blocks, copying down abbreviated versions of the histories of heaven and earth that they deem most important. Few realized at the time that hidden within these fragments of divine truth spread across the world in cosmological texts was concealed a body of teaching that would remain buried within the oldest writings in the world. Abraham was one of these pilgrims, a man of immense learning acquainted with the holy inscriptions of his ancestor Enoch. Almost 4,000 years ago, this patriarch visited Egypt in search of the Arcanum to unearth the past that he might glimpse the future. He is venerated by the adherents of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam and is the central figure to many amazing legends and traditions. Abraham at Giza discerned the truths of the old world. 
penetrated myth and lore. He saw the invisible, uncovered the hidden, and divulged to men the long-buried secrets of his most distant pre-flood predecessors. It was he who discovered that the triangle symbol concealed the greatest of all mysteries, a secret for humanity so incredibly wonderful that its existence caused a rift in the creation as forces beyond our senses fiercely contend over our right to enter into this inheritance. In essence, the lost scriptures of Giza were never really lost. They exist today and can be found in any well-funded university library found among the oldest writings in the world. My name is Jason, and it took 16 years of research to compile enough data to put this book together in the most abbreviated format that I'm capable of. Hundreds of books and source materials, some as old as 15 centuries ago, were amassed to complete this manuscript. So many, so many elements of our history have been lost. These are not things you were going to learn in a collegiate environment. A lot of this is specialist material. There are stories from ancient Egypt that are not being publicized, but anybody can verify them, such as <clears throat> the Genesis record concerns Abraham at 110 years old visiting Egypt, and he has interactions with Pharaoh involving his wife Sarai. But Genesis doesn't go into any other details about his interactions in Egypt. However, an ancient Egyptian record goes into much detail about a man who traveled, a foreigner, a shepherd who came from the land of Philistia, which was the Philistines, where Abraham was living at the time, according to Genesis. And he was 110 years old, and he knew the secrets of the writings of Thoth. And Thoth, to the ancient Egyptians, was a god from ancient history who knew the secrets of the gods and he had much to do with the architecture of the Great Pyramid. But at that time in history, Pharaoh of Egypt was angry at his people and his priest, priesthoods who could not decipher the writings on a monument that they had dug up from the sand of the desert. Most people, when they hear of ancient Egypt and pyramids, they automatically assume the ancient e Egyptian civilization had everything to do with those pyramids, especially at Giza, not realizing that the earliest cap capital of Waset and later Thebes and Karnak and the central Egyptian civilization was hundreds of miles away from the Giza complex. Welcome to part one of the Giza secrets revealed hidden below a more ancient Mediterranean. This presentation will show evidence that the great pyramid complex of Egypt was at one time underwater for a few centuries and that this was known in antiquity. This being underwater, submerged beneath a new Mediterranean sea, resolves many of the anomalies and, and mysteries that scientists and geologists have discovered at the site, such as seashells and salt encrustations and sea life petri and petrified forms that have been found around and on top of stones of the Great Pyramid, as well as the weathering of the Sphinx itself. The calendrical significance of the Great Pyramid involves the cycles of Phoenix destructions, which is covered in several of my other videos. And my books, When the Sun Darkens and Nostradamus and the Planets of Apocalypse. Further, this presentation will also reveal more about the Phoenix in parts two or three, as is revealed within the chronometry of the Great Pyramid itself. Especially in the video, The Great Pyramid Holographic Blueprint of World Destructions. But these knowledges were hidden. There is an engineering function, some anciently powerful technological purpose for the physical structure of the Great Pyramid that much misdirection was employed to conceal it. Let us look deeper into these layer layerings of mysteries and see what we find. Upper Egypt was settled and developed after the Great Diluvian Flood Cataclysm of 2239 BC, which has been dated many times over by independent sources. At the time when everything north of Abydos was underwater, beneath the Mediterranean and Red Sea, which were, were conjoined, there were people living in deeper Africa, which became ancient Egypt, but they had absolutely no connection to the pyramid sites that were built later to the north, bordering the present Mediterranean Sea. This is why the Red Sea Mariner Kingdoms of Magan had flourished. They controlled traffic and trade from the upper sea to the lower sea. The great quake of 1899 BC uplifted the North African plate and the seas were separated. 
dry land appearing. Magan vanished in the days of Means, also called Narmer, who was a royal officer of Sumer named Anum. There are more posts on Anum and Means in the future. He was a very prominent historical personage, and his story is quite unique. Magan vanished in the days of Means. The Egyptian civilization from 2239 to 1899 BC was 340 years. This was all pre-dynastic and all situated in Upper Egypt, which was Southern Egypt, in the sites of Abydos, Thebes, Karnak, Luxor, Hierakonopolis, and Edfu. There are no megalithic pre-dynastic architectural ruins in all of Upper Egypt, and most importantly, these earliest of Egyptian settlements in all of Upper Egypt contain no pyramids. In all the reference works by Egyptologists, these deceitful scholars gloss conven conveniently over the fact that all of Egypt's over 70 pyramids are 300 miles north of the ancient cities of Upper Egypt, all located in Lower Egypt at Giza, Abu Rawash, Saqqara, Dashur, and Hawara. The textbooks describe pyramids, quote, as far south as Awara, unquote. Knowing the readers will probably never look at a map and see that Hawara is in the north, far away from the Egyptian cities of Upper Egypt. Awara is 50 miles south of the Great Pyramid and 290 miles northwest of Upper Egypt's ancient capital cities of Thebes and Karnak Waset. There is no ancient evidence from Thebes, Luxor, Karnak, or anywhere in Upper Egypt that they knew of the Great Pyramid and Sphinx of Giza because all of Lower Egypt was underneath the Mediterranean when Upper Egypt was settled. In fact, Will Hart in the Genesis Race book notes that the Egyptians nowhere left any records of having built the Sphinx or the Great Pyramid of Giza. The complete absence of records concerning the origin and construction of pyramids in Egypt is what led Zechariah Sitchin to conclude there is nothing left to contradict our, content, our contention that these pyramids were built by the gods. On the contrary, everything about them suggests that they were not conceived by men for men's use. Standard Establishment Egyptology, these books are packed with disinformation and deliberately. An example, Gordon C. Baldwin's ridiculous statement in the Pyramids of the New World on page 17. He says, Inside the Great Pyramid, as in other pyramids, there is a network of passageways and shaft and subterranean chambers, with a room called the King's Chamber near the center of the pyramid. Unquote. Everything in this statement is true about the Great Pyramid of Giza, but the inclusion of, as in other pyramids, is a deliberate lie that is foisted upon the public by Egyptologists. The Great Pyramid of Egypt is the only pyramid in the entire world with an ascendant passage, Grand Gallery and King's Chamber. The long, cramped, descending and ascending passages in the Great Pyramid were not made for men to traverse. They are too small. The mo the moving through the structure is tedious, always stooped over and crawling. These passages perform some other function. Strabo described his entry into the interior of the Great Pyramid 21 centuries ago through the north face of the structure, passing through a cleverly hidden hinged stone, which we have found now. He passed down the long descending passage to reach the subterranean chamber and well pit that's in the bedrock. Even as late as the first century BC, the Egyptians still knew nothing about the secret ascendant passage system, the Grand Gallery, Queen's and King's Chambers and Shafts. Not even Herodotus 400 years earlier mentioned anything about them. The great, the, the three Giza pyramids contain hard Aswan granite quarried near, nearly 600 miles to the south. Minkar Pyramid, or the third pyramid, the smallest of the three at Giza, was built using granite, not limestone, like the other two great pyramids, which have only this granite in their interiors. The granite blocks of Minkari are inferior are of inferior masonry, a lack of skill, they're much less precision. With a limestone quarry right across the Nile, why go to the trouble of quarrying, moving, and dressing granite unless its dense crystalline structure was needed for a very specific purpose? Egyptian chronology is contorted due to the obvious high antiquity of the technolithic architecture. 
Claiming all artifacts as Egyptian, scholars erroneously stretch true Egyptian civilization 12 centuries backward into Homo Anunnas technolithic civilization, which was 3439 through 2647 BC. Because scientific data demonstrates that the Giza complex's temples, Sphinx, and the Great Pyramids date to 2900 to 2800 BC, Egyptologists arbitrarily stretch Egypt's first dynasty to circa 3100 BC, also assuming lesser pyramids to impossible anachronistic dates, as with Zoser's stepped pyramid. Imagine scholars trying to claim that the Spanish culture of Central America dates back 12 centuries as proven by the presence of pyramids in the jungle ruins. As the Spanish language has fully spread throughout North, Central, and South America, this contact was initiated not even 5.5 centuries ago. All over the world, people have settled in previously occupied lands containing old ruins erected by unrelated cultures. The Egyptologists claiming that all relics in North Africa being Egyptian or Libyan in origin is simply ridiculous. Academia is not bereft of morons. Zoser's Step Pyramid was an improvisation of Imhotep, who built a mastaba and then constructed a succession of mastabas over it, one over another. Still, the structure is only slightly above 200 feet. To the establishment archaeologists, this is evidence that the stepped pyramid of Saqqara is older than the Giza pyramids, a formative period of learning how to build. However, this is actually proof that by Zoser's time, architects in Egypt did not have a clue how to replicate the pyramids they saw. At Maidum, architects attempted to construct a 52 degree angle pyramid like the slope of the Great Pyramid, but the structure collapsed. At Dashur, the news of the collapse led architects to correct their sloping angle to 43 degrees, resulting in the famous Bent Pyramid. The third pyramid, attributed to Sneferu, also at Dashur, a 43.5 degrees led to the first classical pyramid. Sneferu is dated at the 4th dynasty, which was not circa 2600 BC, as is so popularly taught. Egyptologists have grafted standard Egyptian history onto a much older non-Egyptian civilization that dated before the cataclysm of 2239 BC, which is popularly known as the Great Flood. The Great Pyramid Complex at Giza was built from 2905 to 2815 BC, a total of 90 years of construction, and all other pyramids in Egypt were constructed after 1899 BC, when the quake drained the Mediterranean Sea off, off creating the Delta. The appearance of Means, a foreigner, and his rule was from 1898 to about 1875 BC, and this dating is demonstrated in my Chronicon and will be proven in a later video concerning the identity of this most famous person from Sumer. The Great Pyramid of Giza is the largest megalithic structure in the entire world. A few other structures, also pyramids, do have more mass, but they are not true constructions. These structures in the Americas are filled with rubble and debris from earlier structures filled in. No true pyramids, not true pyramids, but more like mounds faced with stones. To make the matter even more mysterious, the Great Pyramid of Giza was not built on a plain, flat foundation of natural bedrock, but atop a small limestone mound, which bears most of its immense weight. Its lower courses were shaped onto this mound, allowing the gigantic artificial mountain to resonate with the natural energies and vibrations coursing through the bedrock of our, of our world. This mound is mentioned in the Edfu text of Egypt concerning the seven sages. Quote, divine beings who knew how the temples were to be created, they who initiated construction work at, at the great primeval mound. Unquote. The Edfu building text preserved the only references to the seven sages from ancient Egypt, these being the same as the seven sages of the Sumerian text who were admitted to be the Anunnaki. As shown numerous times in my book Anunnaki Homeworld, the orbit of Nibiru is exactly 792 years. This is shown by many historical records. The contact period before the flood was 3439 through 2647 BC, a total of 792 years before Homo Anuna, or while they were on Earth before most of them departed. This 792 years was the distance in time between two different orbital appearances of Nibiru, Perhaps, coincidentally or not, the same unit of measurement employed in the Great Pyramid was also used in designing the Sphinx. 
the Sphinx stands at 66 feet high, or 792 inches. In 2239 BC, the entire valley system now submerged below the waters of the Mediterranean was flooded by the Atlantic Ocean when the land bridge at Gibraltar broke apart. This caused, this caused by subsidence of the entire North African plate. It is a fault line, and it is known well in geology today. The Giza complex, with its pyramids and temples, sank about 600 feet deep, inland as far as Giza, so that only the upper half of the two great pyramids could be seen for a while before they too sank. There was no Egyptian delta or Nine Bows region. From 2239 to 1899 BC, exactly 340 years, the pyramids were underwater and the coast of the newly created Mediterranean that had flooded hundreds of pre-flood communities and stone cities which have been found below the Mediterranean, now located below, uh, in the Aegean area, was during this time almost to Abydos where the Osirion lied. The coastline was all the way hundreds of miles inland from where it is today. This is the reason why ancient Egyptian civilization was settled at Thebes, Waset, Karnak, Abydos, in, in those areas. Because the cardinal orientation of the Great Pyramid's four sides with north, south, east, and west is still accurate today in 2020, we conclude that there has not occurred any lithospheric displacement permanently altering the poles since this date. For 48.3 centuries, the polar axis has been stable. Several times during this period, the planet has moved erratically in temporary pole shifts, stabilizing back within hours. Even the duration of the solar year has changed from 360 days to 365.25. In 1899 BC, the Giza complex emerged out of the sea by quake to be found by men after it was submerged 340 years. In a strange parallel, in 1899 AD, the enormous underground labyrinthine Labyrinth and galleries under the Great Pyramid Complex was rediscovered by Professor Emery. This is definitely evidence for simulation theory. Joseph Jochman wrote that when the pyramid was first entered, there were salt incrustations an inch thick. Chemical analysis in modern times showed that some of the salt had a mineral content consistent with salt from the sea. He also wrote that the medieval Historian Biruni, writing in his treatise, The Chronology of Ancient Nations, noticed the traces of water of the deluge and effects of the waves are still visible on these pyramids halfway up, above which the water did not rise. Here we have a clear picture of what occurred in 2239 BC. The North African plate was submerged and only people from ships could see the two mountains so renowned in the traditions of the old world. This also answers for us why so many archaic traditions concerning the holy mountain at the center of the world was once surrounded completely by water. Even half submerged for 340 years from the deluge in 2239 BC to the quake of 1899 BC that drained the delta into the Nine Bows, we know today the two great pyramids would still have been about 240 feet above the water and impossible to ascend. Only ships could get near them, and the 51.51 degree angled slopes of glass smooth casing blocks were absolutely unclimbable. There was no way anybody could ascend to the top. It would have been a mystery what, what was up there. It would have been some divine, technolithic, technologically looking, looking mountain to a more primitive people who had lost their infrastructure. I say lost their infrastructure because there is a widespread belief in teaching for the past 17 to 18 centuries, especially put forth by Christianity, that the world, the pre-flood world, was some primitive goat herding society that didn't didn't evolve beyond make, maybe make, putting wheels on wagons, but this is absolutely true. The evidence from archaeology is astounding. The technology that they had is, was mind-blowing what they could achieve and what we were finding from ancient records concerning aviation and all the different sciences that we experience today. Welcome to part two of Giza Secrets Revealed, Coptic Records of the Great Pyramid. The earth is very old. Of all the chronologies and calendar systems of long ago that have survived and those used today, very few, if any, claim to span all the way back to a creation event. Most of them stretch back in time to the supposed beginning of mankind or some major event in early history that depopulated our world. 
a reset. One of the dating systems thought to go back the furthest and with the best accuracy is the Annus Mundi chronology, year of the world. Alexandrian scholars in Egypt were familiar with the Annus Mundi dating, but even then there were varying versions and just as the Egyptian priestly classes altered their own sacred calendars to suit their socio-religious purposes, so too did Alexandrian scribes and Christian writers modify Annus Mundi dating to correspond with assumed calendrical points in other dating systems. Over time, this dating has resurfaced, been lost again, reversed research to put back together again until the present day. The Greek astronomer in charge of the library at Alexandria, one of the largest libraries in the entire ancient world, during the reign of Ptolemy III was Eratosthenes. This was 276 through 196 BC. He interpreted Egyptian dynasties as containing periods derived from Genesis dating and was familiar with the Annus Mundi dating. Flavius Josephus, after him, who gave us his antiquities, was acquainted with the AM system as well, even claiming that Solomon, the king, uh, became king about 3100 AM. The Egyptian Book of Sothis, preserved by Senselus in 80, uh, actually 800 Common Era, recorded events in AM years, and Geoffrey of Monmouth, the celebrated author of His Historia Regum Britanni, or the History of the Kings of Britain, also used the Annus Mundi chronology to ascertain that the city of London was founded 1,004 years before the birth of Christ. This would have been 1,004 BC. Even texts from secret societies like the Masons published in the past three and four hundred years date events by Annus Mundi reckoning, principally the Inigo Jones document and the Wood Manuscript. Unlike the Julian Gregorian system, the Annus Mundi calendar is without a break or merging with any other calendar. The greatest and most accurate reconstruction of the Annus Mundi system was performed by Stephen Jones and published in his book, The Secrets of Time. He began year one with the expulsion of humans from Eden, which corresponds exactly with the start of the Hebraic chronology prior to its rabbinical corruption. The Genesis narrative for this year, the first of 1,656 years of the pre-flood era to the devastating deluge, is of mankind banished from paradise. But the darker reality was that year one was a total restart of the world's civilizations and calendars, this being 3895 BC. And as those of you have seen in my other videos, this 3895 year timeline is very prominently displayed in the chronometry of the Great Pyramid of Giza. This was the year of a devastating pole shift, lithospheric displacement that created the continents we know today. For some perspective, understand that the Annus Mundi dating for this year in 2020 is the year 5914. In my very first published book, The Lost Scriptures of Giza in 2006, we learn of the Arab scholar Masaudi, who, who died in 967 Common Era. He left behind an incredible text copied and preserved from the earlier Coptics that concern none other than Enoch himself. This text reads, Surid, one of the kings of Egypt before the flood, built the two great pyramids, that the reason for the building of the pyramids was the following dream, which happened to Surid 300 years previous to the flood. It happened to him that the, flood, that the earth was overthrown, and that the inhabitants were laid prostrate upon it that the fixed stars wandered confusedly from their courses and clashed together with a tremendous noise. In another vision of Surat, he saw the fixed stars descend upon the earth in the form of white birds and seizing the people, enclosed them in a cleft between two mountains which shut upon them. Early in the morning, he assembled the priests from all the gnomes of Egypt, a hundred and thirty in number. No other persons were admitted into this assembly when he related his first and second vision. Mm -hmm. The interpretation was declared to announce that some great event was about to take place. Masaudi's account is astonishing, astonishingly similar to the story of Enoch in the rabbinical book of Jasher. Surid, being a Coptic Enoch, received his prophetic insights from a dream and he was served by 130 priests, just as Enoch ruled over 130 kings and princes. Further, Surid dreamed of two great mountains, 
that were involved with a judgment from heaven, just as Enoch in a vision beheld two great mountains near a third one of lower elevation. At a site, the prophet was told, was a, was a place of judgment. All throughout the biblical narratives, all throughout the Old Testament, we find deserts referred to as places of God's judgment. Both Surid and Enoch beheld a cleft or valley between these mountains where the damned were cast. This vision was of Giza before its construction by the Sethites after Enoch's appearance. Masaudi continues his narrative. Surid, having witnessed the same vision, ordered the pyramids to be built before the flood and the predictions of the priest to be inscribed upon columns, pillars, and upon the large stones belonging to them. And he placed within them his treasures and all his valuable property, together with the bodies of his ancestors. He also ordered the priests to deposit within them written accounts of their wisdom and achievements in the different arts and sciences, the writings of their forefathers, likewise the position of the stars and their circles, together with the history and the chronicles of times past, and that which is to come, and to every future event. And with this excerpt, excerpt from Masaudi's text is our proof that Enoch was remembered as sewered by the cops. Also, these Coptic traditions mention that the pyramids were assigned a guardian. If indeed the pillars of the Sethites are the great pyramids of Giza, then somewhere close by we should find some architectural evidence of their protection in the form of a statue or monument that would serve them as a guardian. As we know, this has been found. The Sphinx, as the largest surviving statue from the ancient world, is 66 feet high, 240 feet long, is also on the Giza Plateau with the pyramids facing east. Much more will be revealed about this mysterious garden, guardian in a later video. It is the opinion of many scholars that Surid was not an Arabic invention. Historians and scholars have long noted the remarkable ability of Arabic historians and chroniclers, translators, who took it upon themselves to per perfectly preserve hundreds if not thousands of texts originally found or housed in Alexandria, Egypt, into their Arabic language. It has been shown that the Arabian scholars passed down the traditions of the Great Pyramid Complex with little or no deviation from the parent sources of over a thousand years earlier. Even today, it is difficult to maintain historical annals and keep them unchanged from decade to decade. As older books are reprinted, inconsistencies are introduced as modern misconceptions taint the text. An interesting connection is that the cops and later Arabs remembered him as Surid, but Josephus, Flavius Josephus, had said that the pillars of the Sethites were built in the land of Syriad. Other traditions name him as Surya. They are all designations for the south. They are all related, linking Surid to Enoch. The Arab historian Abal Muhammad al Hassan bin Ahmed wrote, the pyramids were antediluvian, and they resisted the force of the great flood. Ben Ahmed relied upon the records of Macrizi, an Arab chronicler largely believed to have been Masaudi himself. Probably the most persuasive argument for the pre-flood origin of the Giza pyramids was simply stated by Muhammad ibn al-Hakim when he wrote that the pyramids were built before the deluge, for that, if they had been built after that event had taken place, some positive and certain accounts of them would have remained to us to this day. This is an excellent observation. In the Lost Scriptures of Giza, we explored many traditions from around the world and ancient documents concerning the building of the Great Pyramid, its function, and the histories involved. But this is a Coptic tradition from a manuscript preserved by the Muslims that was not included in the Lost Scriptures of Giza. This ancient Coptic manuscript was found in a tomb in the monastery of Abel Harmi. This text was translated into Arabic by a monk of the monastery of al Kalmun. This text specifically reads, quote, in the first year of King Diocletian, which was the 3rd century AD, 
An account was taken from a book copied in the first year of King Philippus from an inscription of great antiquity written upon a tablet of gold, which tablet was translated by two brothers, Ilwa and Yurka, at the request of King Philippus, who asked them how it happened that they could understand an inscription which was unintelligible to the learned men of his capital. They answered because they were descended from one of the ancient inhabitants of Egypt, who was preserved with Noah in the ark, and who, after the flood had subsided, went into Egypt with his sons, with the sons of Ham, and dying in that country left to his descendants, from whom the brothers had received them, the books of the ancient Egyptians, which had been written 1,785 years before the time of Philippus, 946 years before the arrival of the sons of Ham in Egypt, and contained the history of 2,372 years, and that it was from these books that the tablet was formed. The contents of the books were, We have seen what the stars foretold, we saw the calamity descending from the heavens and going out from the earth with the inhabitants and the plants. The two brothers calculated what time had elapsed from the flood to the day when the translation was made for King Philippus, and it appeared to be 1,741 years. This translation was made for King Philippus in the year 498 B.C., or 1,741 years after the Great Flood in 2239 B.C., which was the year 1656 Annus Mundi, or 1656 Hebrew Reckoning. The text goes on to explain how and why the Great Pyramid was constructed before this catastrophe, which is largely the focus of lost scriptures of Giza. Interestingly, though, Ilwa and Yurka conclude their translation for this king with... And it was in this manner that the pyramids were built. Upon the walls were written the mysteries of science, astronomy, geometry, physics, and much useful knowledge which any person who understands our writing can read. This passage further supports my own contention that the Great Pyramid was indeed covered in myriads of writings that had over millennia faded into obscurity. According to the appendix in the book Origin and Significance of the Great Pyramid, this statement was translated from the Coptic into Arabic in the year 225 after Hijra, which translates into our calendar as either 839 or 840 AD. The Coptic record holds that the pyramids were built and inscribed with the knowledges from which their information derived 946 years before the arrival of the sons of Ham in Egypt. This would have been 2843 BC, or the year 1052 Annus Mundi, only four years difference from the Sumerian king list regnal year of 2839 BC, which was the first year of Noah in the Hebraic records, when the seven kings began their reign, the year that Noah was born. Due to the expanse of 4,000 years in these calculations, a variance of four years is virtually precise. But this may have been a deliberately contrived disparity. As shown in Lost Scriptures of Giza, there were once 144,000 white polished limestone casing blocks upon the surfaces of the Great Pyramid, the lower courses with minute inscriptions, and there are four years between these two dates, which under the pre-flood draconian calendar system would have been exactly 360 times 4, which is 1,440 days. The Sethite builders of the monument had a direct descendant who would visit this site, a man remembered by many nations today. His name was Abram, later to, to be renamed Abraham in the Jewish scriptures. And what Abram brings to the table in our understanding of the Great Pyramid is going to blow your mind, and it is absolutely the subject matter of the next video. This is Archaics.com, and we're going to go a little bit deeper into the esoterica and little-known records of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Our focus is on Abraham. This is part three of Secrets of Giza. Abraham is especially venerated by the Hebrews, Christians, and Muslims, the pretty much patriarch of three major world religions. 
He is indirectly known by other names by the, uh, of the Persians as Zoroaster, by the Greeks Hermes, and many other titles by just as many cultures. His actual name, Abramu, has been found in some Assyrian writings according to Smith in his Chaldean Genesis. In the, in the Egyptian Sheshonk list, mention is made of a fortress of Abram. Having spent the majority of his life in Chaldea and Canaan, we are not surprised to discover that Abram's name has been found inscribed within Canaanite Rashamra stone tablets of the second millennium BC. Abraham and his connection to the Great Pyramid and ancient Egypt is well documented in the literature of the ancient world and is the subject of the book Lost Scriptures of Giza, Enochian Mysteries of the World's Oldest Text. The Giza complex of the Great Pyramid in Egypt in ancient Hebraic records was called Akuzan. This was the site in the books of Jasher and the book of Enoch that the architect prophet Enoch himself ascended to the heavens and was never seen again. Abraham lived four centuries after a civilization reset, popularly known as the Great Deluge, which occurred in 2239 BC. Hebraic traditional writings hold that Abraham went to Egypt and taught the astrologers and wise men of Pharaoh's court great secrets of God hidden in the stars and celestial motions. Such a claim is also confirmed in the Masonic document called the Wood Manuscript, which dates from the year 1610. The Wood Manuscript claims that the sciences and knowledge taught by Abraham had been derived from one of the pillars that had been discovered in the desert, and that, as one learned in the scribal mysteries of the Sumerians, Abraham understood these writings and related them to the earliest Egyptians. The pillar was one of the Giza pyramids covered in minute inscriptions from the pre-flood world seen by the baffled Greek and Roman historians Diodorus and Strabo 2,000 years later. The Masonic Inigo Jones document cited the same information, however, Abraham here is substituted for Hermes. It is clear that Abraham is the subject of the context, however, because the text claims the antediluvian writings were found upon excavated pillars that were translated by a minister to Osiris, king of Egypt, during the reign of Ninus, who was Nimrod according to the Assyrians. Alexandrian historians identified two distinct Hermes figures. The first was the builder of the pillars, and the second came much later. It was the second Hermes that found the pillars and translated them according to Iamblichus, who wrote that the second Hermes lived after the flood. And this would no doubt be Abraham, who according to the Inigo Jones document, taught the ancient Egyptians the zodiac and the secrets of the stars, hieroglyphics, and diverse sciences. Such is further substantiated in the book of Jasher, which states that in the days of Abraham, the king of Egypt was Osiris, the son of Anam. This, in ancient Egypt, was Mina, also known as Means. Very few Egyptologists are even aware that the first five Egyptian dynasties are Sumerian. They have nothing to do with Egypt at all. That's why they cannot be verified by Egyptologists. Mina was Anam of Sumer. The Jasher account extensively outlines Nimrod's life and reign and even his personal experiences with Abram, the son of one of his favored Babylonian war generals named Terah. The connection between Osiris, second ruler of Egypt, and Nimrod of Chaldea is nothing short of astonishing. But even more incredible is the evidence that this minister to the Egyptian ruler at that time was in fact Abraham. Cyrilus Alexandrinus in Contra Julianum wrote, that long ago a powerful Chaldean visited Egypt, a man of immense wisdom. Such a historical reference would not have been recorded if this stranger had not left a powerful impact upon the Egyptian people at such a remote time in their culture's infancy. Many Chaldeans have visited Egypt. If such an incredibly wise man of learning did visit Pharaoh's court, then such an event could not have remained unacknowledged in, G in Egypt's own archives. Setting aside the apparent anachronism so prevalent in interpretations of Egyptian history, we learn that an Egyptian record called the Westcar Papyrus does tell that during the reign of Khufu, a foreigner visited Egypt, a venerable man of 110 years age who was believed to be able to perform miracles but was known greatly for his vast wisdom. Of particular fascination to the sages of Pharaoh's court was the fact that this stranger to Egypt was acquainted with the mysteries of Thoth. Thoth is the Egyptian Enoch. 
Abraham was a Chaldean by birth and a servant of the mysteries of Enoch through Noah and Enoch's inscriptions upon the tables kept by the Sethites after the flood. At age 110, Abraham was living among the Philistines at the eastern borders of the land of Egypt, so it is not improbable that he could have spent a com considerable time translating these pillars, these pyramid inscriptions at Giza, for the Egyptians. The Greek historian Herodotus may have inadvertently recorded this as well. Concerning the pyramids at Giza, Herodotus wrote that they had been built by one named Philition, who which is merely a Greek title meaning native of Philly. He was also called Philistus, a shepherd who frequently fed his flocks near Giza. In Civilization or Barbarism by Sheik Anta Diop on page 281, we find that he wrote that Philistus was, was the person who brought the secret of the calendar into Egypt. Exactly what is said of Thoth, what is also said of Hermes, and what is also said of Enoch. The Westcar Papyrus reveals that this 110-year-old man knew the number of the chambers of Thoth, some Egyptologists interpreting this to mean the secret chambers of the primeval sanctuary, according to Zechariah Sitchin in The Wars of Gods and Men. This visitor to Egypt of old claimed to know where the plans with numbers were hidden. This, no doubt, was what Abraham found inside the primeval sanctuary, or the Great Pyramid. It is quite possible that he did not build these monuments. It's actually probable. But because of his own fame, he later became identified with them. All of this further identifies Abraham, who was a shepherd and a nomad who, nomad who was living in the area of the Philistine city of Gerar when he was 110 years old. It is obvious that after the passage of so many years, the historical accounts of different scribes and records would have become slightly confused. It is not a stretch of the imagination to assume that the Egyptians would have later credited the stranger with the building of the monuments if he had been remembered as the one who had translated the mysterious writings found upon them. Also, there is every chance that Abraham is the reason why the Great Pyramid Complex is remembered as Giza. Abraham was a Chaldean from Haran, a city right next to a major city of Gozan in northern Babylonia, and he later moved and lived among the Philistines in the city of Gaza, which was the chief city of the Philistine Pentapolis of the five lords of the Philistines. Gaza is actually pronounced Geza, and could easily be the origin of the present Giza. One of the cities of the Pentapolis was also called Gath, which was the home of the famous giant Goliath. All evidence points that the enigmatic writings of the Book of the Dead, as well as some of the older biblical records and the ancient writings of many early civilizations, merely borrowed their source materials from the inscriptions preserved through the flood that were engraved into the faces of the Great Pyramid. Though Egyptologists claim that the writings that constitute the Book of the Dead were so extensive that they required editing and abbreviation into shorter works to be adequately used, this appears to be the case with most of the world's oldest historical writings. This is especially the case with the little understood and mysterious Edfu wall texts. Discovered in Upper Egypt to the far south of Egypt was an archive of ancient glimpses into an even earlier past that appeared to have been unique to Edfu. Even more peculiar is that the Edfu writings tell of the plans for the great temple that predated the other temples of Egypt that dropped out of heaven near Memphis and that Imhotep built this edifice according to these plans. Memphis is the area of the Giza Plateau, only a few miles between them. What's interesting is that these Edfu records were found on the far side of Egypt to the deep south, on the edges of Nubia instead of near Memphis. These plans are the divine instructions received by Enoch concerning the architectural dimensions of the Great Pyramid so prevalent in the Book of Enoch and in the Book of Jasher. The Edfu inscriptions tell of a distant history of Egypt concerning the first time, called Zeptepi, the primordial sages, primeval gods, the abyssal waters of the nun that existed prior to the creation of our world, of alien gods before the Egyptian deities, an enemy in the visage of a serpent and a great conflict that brought this earlier world to a devastating end. Linking these writings to the Book of the Dead and the Great Pyramid is the fact that these writings are attributed to Thoth. 
Andrew Collins in Gods of Eden, Egypt's Lost Legacy and the Genesis of Civilization cites these strange writings and goes on to write that all of the inhabitants of this earlier world perished and when the world was brought back out of the darkness of ruin, the world contained the ghosts of this earlier civilization. The only relic to have survived this judgment was a single jed pillar located in the field of reeds. This would serve to identify the delta area and surrounding regions where Giza lies, for the field of reeds is adjacent to the sea of reeds, commonly referred to in the scripture as the Red Sea, crossed by the Israelites when fleeing Egypt. When Abraham traveled to Egypt, he already knew what was there. He knew the altar of God in Egypt and its hidden identity as the pillar of Enoch that represented the holy mountain of God and its function as a terrestrial gateway between heaven and earth and earth and the underworld. Underworld. The entire concept was already known to him and passed to him from, from his own ancestors. He translated these mysteries for the Egyptians and wrote his own records as well, which has been preserved in Genesis and within very obscure passages in the oldest Psalms. There is every possibility that he discovered the writings of the apocalypse upon the faces of the, of the stones of the pyramid. The revelation record as recorded by John is truly a masterpiece of ancient symbolism and extinct motives. It was written in Greek, but the Greeks nor Hebrews could have understood it 2,000 years ago because the language of symbolism employed is specifically of Sumerian origin. The end of the world was written in the signs, motives, symbols, and language of imagery that could have only been com completely comprehended by those who had lived in the beginning prior to the Great Deluge Reset. Abraham's ministry to Earth, Earth's earliest post-apocalyptic civilizations was no accident, for the work of Abraham's translation of these holy mysteries to the world was the result of an Enochian prophecy foretold almost a thousand years prior to the Flood. In the book of the secrets of Enoch, we read that after the flood shall arise another, genera gen another generation, and he who raises that generation, Abraham, shall reveal to them the books of thy handwriting, Enoch's, to them to whom he must point out the guardianship of the world, to the faithful men and workers of my pleasure who do not acknowledge my name in vain. The early Egyptians learned through the wise Abraham the contents of the glyphic writings at Giza and immediately incorporated these writings into their theology. These translations often meant nothing to the Egyptians other than that they were of divine importance and were words and phrases needed in the afterlife. Egyptologists admit that it was often the case that even Egyptian scribes long ago meticulously preserved hieroglyphic texts even though they themselves did not quite understand the meaning of the text themselves. These inscriptions were placed inside tombs upon temple walls as walk-in books, walk-in walk coffins, uh, on artwork, on beads, inside crypts, on obelisks, on, on the faces of monuments. They were erected everywhere throughout Egypt. One can read the Book of the Dead, which is a compilation of these texts from all over Egypt, from which has, has been come to be called the Papyr Papyrus of, of Ani, and see clearly that these writings have little, if anything, to do with Egypt. They are full of obscure imagery, like the Ladder of Set, probably Sethites, and the Pillar of Thoth, that hint to an older theology, one extant long prior to the traditional Egyptian pantheon. There is a mystery these writings seek to explain that involves the secrets of resurrection and the identity of the monument itself. When Abraham first lie, lie, laid eyes on the excavations at Giza and witnessed the pyramids rising out of the sands of the desert waste almost 4,000 years ago, he knew he was looking at an earthly model of the city of God placed there by his antediluvian Sethite forebears. It is in the New Testament book of Hebrews that we find a curious fragment that has never been adequately explained. It specifically reads that Abraham did look for a city whose builder and maker was God. And now we know he did this at Egypt, at Giza. Because we have no biblical references to such a historic quest by the patriarch, we know that he did not look only with earthly eyes. Abraham looked upon the monuments of Giza with spiritual sight that prophetically witnessed the coming of God to earth, the descent of the chief cornerstone to sit upon as a throne the monument of man. Every single block 
representing an immortal soul of humanity. With all of this information, we are confronted with mythological and symbolic imagery from post-technolithic cultures who were conveying as best they could the amazing knowledge of a gigantic pyramid structure built in an age before a cataclysm, and of a single person after that disaster who arrived in Egypt and explained this monument, which he which then gave rise to the immense writings of the Book of the Dead, later the Pyramid Texts, the Edfu Texts, the Coffin Texts, the Vedas, the Puranas, and many other ancient writings. They called the Great Pyramid an altar, a pillar holding up the sky, the ladder of Set, the stairway to heaven, the gate of the deep, the Axis Mundi, the divine mountain at the middle of the earth, or men the soul, even the tree of life. This man told them that the monument was not complete because the chief cornerstone had not yet descended upon it. As the learned men scattered from Egypt, taking his teachings with them, they returned to their own homelands and for the next five centuries, empires, nations, city-states, and even remote island communities built their own pyramids around the world and maintained them in the hope that this god would choose their altar to make his descent. The Lost Scriptures of Giza serve to show how all of the oldest writings, including Brahmanic, are abbreviated versions of vast corpuses of ancient texts all taken from the surface stones of the Great Pyramid, which explains the uncanny similarities in context, in content, in syntax of historical cosmologies and apocalypses from cultures thought to have never experienced contact. Welcome to Part 4, Giza Secrets Revealed. This is the Coffin Text Mystery. 1080. This is a presentation by Archaics.com. Abraham's association to the Great Pyramid is the subject of much Vedic esoterica. Yes, I know it's surprising to even make a historical association between the ancient Aryan people of India, the Vedic and Sanskrit literature, and the Hebraic, and linking it to the Great Pyramid of Giza seems to be a stretch, but the evidence is pretty overwhelming. The Vedic writings of India venerate Brahma as the creator and a god of remote antiquity, but he is not the oldest in the pantheon, nor could he be, for Brahma, renowned for wisdom and knowledge of the past and future, is merely Abraham, translator of the Giza text known in Vedic literature as the Altar of Agni. In fact, in the, in the transference between uh, the, old, the Sanskrit and the Semitic languages, Brahma and Abram, is the same word. The chief characteristics given to Brahma were as creator, preserver, and destroyer, which is unusual because Brahma was assigned a very minor role. He appears after the pantheon was already complete. This disparity is understood by realizing that these characteristics were later attached to Abram after he had translated the pre-flood text that did contain the histories and prophecies from an elder civilization, pre-cataclysm. The confusion over Brahma and Agni both relate to Abraham and his contact with the Great Pyramid's inscriptions after the flood. The Vedic books tell that Brahma was at the bottom of the ocean during the flood and that Brahma had four faces. What was a deity doing at the bottom of the sea? And how does he have four faces? What is, really, what is really being described here is a monument. The imagery conveyed is actually of the four-faced Great Pyramid under the waters of the flood when the Mediterranean Sea was first created in 2239 BC, drowning over 200 valley cities and the Giza complex itself. This flood is exactly the reason why ancient Egyptian civilization was, at, was started hundreds of miles to the south. Depictions of Brahma from India are directly related to Giza correspondences. Four-headed Brahma supports a triune glyph identifying Brahmanic uh, trinity and rests atop a seven-petaled lotus, a symbol for creative power, with a long stem, like a planetary axis, axis mundi, a pillar that descends to the navel, which is the middle of Vishnu, who lays on top a seven-headed dragon in the abyss of waters, the ocean and space, Vishnu, Vishnu covered the deep much in the same way that the Great Pyramid covers the entrance to the underworld in many traditions. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva 
made up the Hindu trinity, Brahma appearing with four faces identifying him as the Great Pyramid. Vishnu was the coverer who covered the deep, which is the symbolic function of the Sphinx. And Shiva is merely a number anciently personified into a deity, the number seven. Scholars of Sanskrit literature assert that the number, number assigned to the altar of Agni was also seven. And those of you that have read my Lost Scriptures of Giza also saw an entire chapter showing how the Great Pyramid was built in units of seven and that the 51.51 .51 degree angle could have only been accomplished by using a instrument that divided whole 360 degree circles into units of seven. Lost Scriptures heavily focused on this number and its relation to the Great Pyramid's interior and exterior angles of 52 degrees. Interestingly, the god Shiva was also represented as having five faces. The fifth face, face pointing up toward the sky and was usually identified with the world axis. Again, the fifth face, the surface, would link this imagery with the flat top of the Great Pyramid, which has no top stone. Four faces facing the cardinal directions of north, east, south, and west. The fifth face is the top facing the sky. There can be no doubt as to the identity of the, of the Vedic Brahma being the prominent historical figure of Abraham, for his consort in the ancient Vedic literature was Saraswati, just as Abraham's wife was his half-sister, Sarah. Indian tradition claims that Brahma committed incest with his consort because they were related. This is the exact same accusation that was levied against Abraham. The altar of Agni is a mine of revelations. The word altar comes from a root meaning knowledge, just as Veda means knowledge. The altar is akin to the Great Pyramid, called by the prophet Isaiah the altar in the midst of Egypt at the border to the Lord thereof. Border in Hebrew, in any, in any concordance or lexicon, you will see is the word Gezi, which is very close to Giza. In the archaic Vedic beliefs of the Aryan people of India, there existed a holy place at the center of earth constructed of 10,800 bricks containing the knowledges of the past, present, histories, and sciences, and the future. It was the altar of Agni, the fire deity. Pyramid word contains the root for fire as well. In my book, Lost Scriptures of Giza, I show proofs that the Great Pyramid was considered by the ancients to be a gigantic altar. In the Vedic traditions, the altar of Agni was drowned in the sea. The oldest of all Sanskrit texts is the Rig Veda. It is divided into 10 books containing 10,800 stanzas, or, or 1080 stanzas each. Further, the altar of Agni was called also, uh, it was associated with the fire go god Surya. This being paralleled by Josephus' statement that the Great Pyramid was built in the land of Syriad, and the later Coptic traditions about the builder of the pyramids being named Surid. Of course, co a further coincidence is that Heraclitus the Obscure taught that the world is destroyed every 10,800 years. He was an Ionian scholar of Ephesus about 503 BC. He was nicknamed the Obscure for the difficulty of his writings. Heraclitus opposed polytheism and idolatry, declaring there to be one eternal reality, and he believed that the self in man was a part of the divine intelligence. He is quoted as saying to the men of Ephesus, your knowledge of many things does not give you wisdom. In 1972, Lyle Robinson wrote, The Great Pyramid of Giza is generally believed to have been constructed about 2900 BC. In 1984, a total of 64 samples taken from the Great Pyramid were radiocarbon dated to produce a consistent date of about 2900 BC. In 1995, another 353 samples were taken and radiocarbon dated to again produce the result of 2900 BC. This 2900 BC dating is scientific bullseye for the date the Great Pyramid gives itself. It was begun in 2905 BC and it was finished in 2815 BC. The Great Pyramid was completed using machines. The work began in the year 990 Annus Mundi, or 990 years after the Great Pole Shift Reset of 3895 BC, known more popularly as the Fall from Eden. Thus, 90-year construction period 
was exactly 1080 months. The Giza complex completed in the year 2815 BC, which was the year 1080 Annus Mundi, 666 years before the great deluge of Noah in 2239 BC. For those of you who are very interested in chronology and want to see the source materials on this, my book is 510 pages long and absolutely free to the public. It is on archaics.com. It is called Chronicon. Find the Chronicon link on Archaics homepage and you can read all, all the chronological data and source materials that you want. The three-dimensional geometry of a pyramid is a four is four lower corners and one high corner or five points to make a solid pyramid. When the 3D form is rendered in one dimension, a flat plane, the five points form a pentagram. The pentagram or five-pointed star in ancient Sumer was called the Dengir, or the symbol not only for a god, but also the symbol for the Arab denoting something that falls from the sky to break up the ground. The five-pointed star in geometry is made up of 10 perfect 108 degree angles comprising the sum of 1080. The three-dimensional geometry of the pyramid forms the date 1080 which in the pre-flood chronology was the 1080th year of the 1656 years of the antediluvian history to the Great Flood in 2239 BC, which was the year 1656 Annus Mundi and Hebrew Reckoning. 1080 AM was 2815 BC, the completion of the Great Pyramid. John Mitchell wrote that 1080 was a unique number representing prophecy and intuition. In Greek, the term Fountain of Wisdom has the geometrical value of 1080, as does Realm of the Dead, Tartaros. Mitchell wrote that 1080 was a lunar number opposite of its solar counterpart, which is interesting, 666. Though Mitchell did not know it, the completion of the Giza complex in 1080 AM was exactly 666 years to the Great Flood Cataclysm in the year 1656, which is our in our calendar, of course, is 2239 BC. When according to the ancients, the sun was born. The water sun age began with the collapse of the vapor canopy. Before this collapse of the marine firmament, the whole earth was like a greenhouse and the entire sky was lit up, but there was no round sun visible. What are we to make of so many parallels? Egyptian heliopolitan influence coffin texts preserve the fact of the presence of something of extreme importance beneath the Great Pyramid Plateau, according to Andrew Collins. Amazingly, the coffin texts preserve this secret as spell 1080. This is the subject of this video. This coffin text mystery 1080 reads, This is the sealed thing which is in darkness, put in Rostau. It has been hidden since it fell from him, and it is what came down from him onto the desert of sand. Collins believes that spell 1080 parallels a portion of the book of Enoch, which is intriguing, for as shown in Lost Scriptures of Giza, it was Enoch who was the architect of the Great Pyramid. The famous Egyptologist Wallace E. Budge wrote that the Egyptians who copied older hieroglyphic texts often did not understand what they were transcribing. Spell 1080 is a mistake of translation, which in its original form meant year 1080. It was the year 1080 Annus Mundi that the Great Pyramid, the sealed thing, was finished by the gods, non-Egyptians. Rostau was a gateland of the dead one traveled to get to to get to the next life and has been linked by many researchers to the Giza complex. It was year 1080 that the thing that landed in the desert came down from heaven. Remember, it was Strabo who said to over 2,000 years ago that the Great Pyramid was still perfectly intact in his day and it looked like a building that had been set down from heaven. Later Arab traditions are little different than the Aryan and Egyptian memories. Arabic pre-Islamic tradition holds that there is a preserved tablet from of old, a writing of stone dating from the beginning of time that contains all the history, knowledges, and prophecies. The angel of death is there, 
with 1080 eyes searching continually through the records to make sure no one dies before their time. This same preserved tablet is but was originally the preserved writings on the faces of the Great Pyramid, linked again to the number 1080 and linked again to Rostow, the realm of death. Thousands of books in the past 300 years have sought to show that the Great Pyramid contains the mysteries of Earth, the Moon, and planets, the Sun, orbital data, distances, velocities. People conceive of concepts they ordinarily cannot prove, yet the evidence is there. At the Earth's equator, the rotation of the planet is moving at 1,080 miles per hour. Further, because of the distance and velocity of the Moon and Earth's own rotation, the lunar umbra, the Moon's shadow of total darkness during an eclipse, travels across the face of the Earth at a mean average of 1080 miles per hour. Also, 1080 pixels is the highest resolution the human eye can perceive. Anything advertising more or better clarity is just marketing. Concerning pixels, one of the most controversial photographs ever taken was satellite photo 70A13, taken of the Mars surface that depicts the famous sphinx-like face in the Cydonia region of Mars, a monument staring upward into the sky positioned close to the unique pentahedral pyramid known as the DNM pyramid. Perhaps coincidentally, this amazing photograph happened to have been taken with us by one of our satellites at exactly 1080 miles away. So many interesting coincidences. In 2239 BC, the Giza complex and entire northern coastlands of Africa plunged beneath the newly formed Mediterranean Sea and remained underwater for 340 years till 1899 BC when another quake uplifted the region, draining it off to create the only delta in the world, emptying a river that runs from south to north, making the Great Pyramid to be located precisely 108 miles to the newly formed Mediterranean coast. That the Giza site is associated to cataclysm is, is in all of the traditions that is widely acknowledged of it. Giza's construction before the flood in 990 AM or 2905 BC began a 1080 year countdown to the year 2070 Annus Mundi, which was 1825 BC, which was the 12th and final year that Abram was living among the Philistines of Gerar, spending several years at Giza in Egypt translating the antediluvian Sethite text, the origin of the concept of the Egyptian Set deity. Found inscribed upon the, the, surface, the surface stones of the Great Pyramid, Abram's translating and appearance before the Egyptian court is fully detailed in Lost Scriptures of Giza. These facts could easily be put together and used as an argument for simulation theory. The synchronicities are astounding. Whether these histories are true is not the point. Taken from widespread sources, when put together, they form this patterned 108, 1080, and 10,800 matrix of events, concepts, and dates. These facts are more evidence that we exist within a holographic simulated reality than this world is actually real, a solid traveling through a vacuum. These and thousands of other contrived coincidences is why I do not involve myself in engaging whether the world is a sphere obeying outdated Newtonian constants or a flat plane under a dome because neither are true while both are correct. Remember, in a holosphere, contrary realities can coexist easily because the individual perceptions of observers are entirely subjective. In this video, we discovered more information that Abram was connected to the Great Pyramid, that the monument dated itself to 2815 BC of the Old World Year 1080. That many ancient cultures remembered this 1080 date in various ways. That the structure was discovered by the ancients after it had been lost and that the Great Pyramid was known to have been underwater due to a cataclysm. These are the records of, of tradition and religious writings as passed down from distant antiquity. Welcome to Part 5, Giza Secrets Revealed, Sumerian Memories of the Great Pyramid. My name is Jason, host of Archaics.com, and I'm willing to venture that you're going to learn new material about the Great Pyramid you did not know. In Part 1 of Giza Secrets Revealed, hidden below a more ancient Mediterranean, we learned that the Great Pyramid Complex had been underwater for a long period of time. 
And in part two, the Coptic records of the Great Pyramid, this was confirmed by Arab scholars who had preserved many older Egyptian fragments concerning the monument. In part three, we learned about Abraham at the Great Pyramid and an astonishing Egyptian text that confirms his identity. In part four, we learn the date the Great Pyramid was constructed and how this was confirmed in Coffin Text Mystery 1080. And now, in part five, we're going to delve into the ancient memories of Sumer and what they recalled about the Great Pyramid. Controversial author Zechariah Sitchin relates that the religious beliefs of the early peoples from India to China and Japan believed that the navel of the earth was a mountain called Sumeru, where the gods of heaven and earth were located, where the bond that connected heaven to earth was in the form of two pyramids, one inverted atop the other. This is a memory of the Great Pyramid of Giza, and that is the only monument with ascendant and descendant passages and chambers that internally resembled a pyramid inverted atop another. In addition, in addition, the original pyramid monument was surrounded by water in a system of channels and locks that held the water in place from the Nile River. In the ancient Sumerian tradition, the e Kur at Nippur was considered the navel of the earth. At the city of Nippur, at the center stood a heavenward pillar reaching to the sky as a platform that cannot be overturned, according to the ancient Sumerian texts. This was actually Giza, not in Sumer. The Great Pyramid, the Pillar of Heaven, also called Irem of the Columns, also the Axis Mundi. From here, Enlil would send his word out. Abundance would pour down on earth. Sitchin believes it was a communication device to call spacecraft. I contend this, as my earlier videos have shown quite abundantly that the Great Pyramid has everything to do with our holospheric programming. But his, 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 theory, his, theory, his theory could still be tenable. But Enlil's lofty house, the pyramid, had a mysterious chamber called the Durga. Sitchin was aware of the similarities between the Great Pyramid site and the pre-flood e Kur temple of Enlil, he believing the e Kur was merely Enlil's ziggurat in Nippur. This is entirely an error. This e Kur housed the Duranki, or a bond between heaven and earth. Inside was located the Durga, which contained a dark chamber possessing orbital data. Sitchin also recognized that Sumerian texts describe the Eker, the house which is like a mountain, as also being located at a distant place. So evidently the Sumerians left us records that Zechariah Sitchin had translated or had, had seen from another translator that totally admitted from the Sumerian perspective that the Eker site was at a distant place from Sumer. It was not in Nippur, one of the Sumerian cities. He admits a belief that the Anunnaki constructed the Great Pyramids of Giza and even notes that the scholars have been puzzled by a reference of the e Kur as being far away from Sumer. But Sitchin errs in promoting that the Anunnaki had anything to do with Sumer or its own e Kur, which were ziggurats, which were merely human constructions attempting to emulate the earlier Anunnaki concepts built far away at Giza. Sitchin further makes a serious chronological mistake of claiming that the Giza artifacts were built after the flood, a dating he asserts in contradiction to every ancient source of information on the subject. This dating is equally ludicrous as his belief that the Great Flood was about 11,000 BC, 87 centuries before almost every archaic writer claimed the deluge had occurred. In the city of Nippur, the e Kur stood, clad in awesome brilliance. White limestone casing blocks of the Great Pyramid are, rem are we are reminded of here. An enigmatic Sumerian poem reads, e Kur, house of the god with pointed peak. For heaven to earth it is greatly equipped. Men cannot understand it. But can we? 
In prior videos, I demonstrated the holographic nature of the Giza complex, which extends to its traditions as well. Take this for example. The E. Kerr was located at the place of Azag, the Great Serpent. Enki, which, yeah, which, is, which was a reference to Enki, Sitchin relates that many Sumerian words retain their meaning when read in reverse, like anagrams, very similar to what occurs in a hologram with arithmetic. Azag thus becomes Gaza, or Giza. The Durga was the most restricted chamber where celestial charts and orbital data was kept, the Tablets of Destinies, according to Sitchin. It was located inside the Great Pyramid. Interestingly, as we view the Sumerian facts through the lens of reality's reflective holosphere, we see that Durga mirrors the English phrase, a grid. In the story of Zhu, he entered Enlil's sanctuary and stole the Tablets of Destinies, whereupon the hallowed inner chamber lost its brilliance, stillness spread, silence prevailed. Sitchin asserts that the Sumerian concept of destinies concerned planetary orbits. He links the Tablets of Destinies with the bond between heaven and earth. Interestingly, the internal arrangements of the Great Pyramid form orbital periods for the planet Phoenix, rectilinear distances in the architectural features all divisible by 138 as shown in two of my videos. Reflecting the 138 year reappearance of, of Phoenix, whether it be a planet or a mechanism. This I have shown over and over in Chronotexture and in Chronicon. Chronicon is 510 pages and is absolutely free to the public. It is on archaics.com. The Great Pyramid is indeed a grid, a durga, a holographic one that depicts two major planetary destinies. Phoenix returns in May of 2040 to begin a major depopulation of the Earth by cataclysm, and Nibiru follows in November of 2046 to finalize the depopulation protocol. Both of these planets are clearly seen in the Apocalypse as two major disasters that occur in the Book of Revelation, the Sixth Seal of the Apocalypse and the Third Trumpet Judgment, Wormwood. That Enki was identified here is not surprising, as he is later, later known as the Biblical Enoch. In the non-canonical text, Enoch was the builder of the Great Pyramid, the prophet against the Watchers and Giants, the doomsayer over the Nephilim. He predicted the Great Flood, and he is prominent in the traditions of the Phoenix. The Sumerian traditions concern a place before Sumer, far away. There are no technolithic or post-technolithic ruins anywhere in Sumer or Babylonia. The entire Near East contains only Heliolithic ruins. Architectural remains of the Old Bronze Age. The stories of the E. Kerr of Azag and the cities of Nippur and Eridu, which is the Irad of Genesis chapter 5, are memories of a, of, a, of a period before Sumer at a place distant from the region of Sumer, Babylonia. Proof of this is also found in the stories of Enki. Another body of archaic Sumerian records holds that Enki designed a sacred temple structure called the Eni Enu, built by a ruler named Gudea. This structure is believed by scholars to have been a ziggurat, a type of pyramid, but the details concerning Enki and Eni Enu specifically relate to the Great Pyramid of Giza, Azag. The Eni Enu was a structure with its cornerstone embedded by Ningishida, the master builder said to be kin to Enki. Ningish Zeta was the Egyptian Tahuti or Thoth, Enoch. He was the lord of the artifact of life, according to Zechariah Sitchin. It was a temple, a heaven-earth mountain. Its head reached heavenward. Its brickwork was faced with bright stones of a certain thickness. Sitchin notes that this was not a Sumerian architectural feature, but an Egyptian one. The Great Pyramid had 144,000 white limestone blocks, very bright, that weighed 20 tons each and were 100 inches thick. This was the skin that protected the outer surfaces of the Great Pyramid before the Muslims removed it in the 13th century after an earthquake to build the city of Cairo. For this reason, the Sumerian text reads, like a bright mass it stands, a radiant brightness of its facing covers everything like a mountain which glows. 
The pyramid structure is associated to a goddess called Nasabi, who possessed a stylus of seven numbers. Nasabi knew the secrets of numbers. The same thing is said of Thoth and Enoch. And Sitchin compares Nasabi to the Egyptian goddess Shesheta, the goddess of construction and the calendar, who wore a smooth-sided pyramid hat, a Sumerian goddess exhibiting an Egyptian-style pyramid. He also notes that the depiction of a god wearing a monument on a hat was decidedly a Sumerian innovation. En Enu was the name of the sacred place before the flood built by gods, the Anunnaki, as told by the people of the Sumerian city of Lagash. But the people of Uruk, biblical Eric of Genesis, called it Enu, and it was also considered a ziggurat by the scholars unaware of its connection to the Giza structures. Sumerian temple traditions were fragments from an earlier period concerning the mystery surrounding the monument built only by the gods, the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Sitchin notes that Iana was the pure sanctuary and that the gods themselves had fashioned its parts. Iana's purpose was as the house for descending from heaven. The temple of Anu, heaven, was called Iana, the house of An similar to On, a city named Anu in Egypt later called Heliopolis, and, not coincidentally, it's right next to the Giza Plateau. It was this holy sanctuary before the flood at a place called Eridu that no one uninvited can enter. In its sanctuary, from the abyss, the divine formulas Inki had deposited. The Tablets of Destiny's divine formulas, what was stored in the Great Pyramid, was something of advanced scientific or technological value, something that was removed deliberately by its designer. Sitchin spent a prodigious, prodigious amount of energy trying to create an antediluvian Sumer, a civilization of Sumerians before the deluge. His version is that the Sumerian cities were destroyed in the flood and that the survivors rebuilt those cities and that there was no migration of peoples to a new area. But this is an error. There was a world before the flood. There were cities, a thriving civilization long before Egypt existed. The Sumerians recorded fragments concerning a world that was not their own. What had happened was that a thriving civilization right there at the Giza Plateau met with a flood when the Mediterranean overtook its bound boundaries, when the Atlantic crashed through the Strait of Gibraltar. I have a video on that topic. The flood created the Mediterranean in a day 200 cities were flooded. The survivors left that area because it was underwater, and they went to the next river valley, which was the Tigris Euphrates, and they became the Sumerians. Three buildings found underground in Egypt, buried below the desert. Entire dynasties of ancient Egypt passed and no pharaohs knew these structures existed. We are told they're temples, but we have no evidence of that. Welcome to part six of Giza Secrets Revealed. Two of these temples are at Giza and a third is located at Abydos to the south. For most of ancient Egyptian history, all three of these structures were buried underground. Entire dynasties passed without any pharaohs being aware that they were there. The Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple are both at Giza and were both constructed from 200 ton stacked blocks that were every bit as much of an engineering feat as that of the Great Pyramids of Giza. All of the blocks are gigantic and it the least of them weigh 50 tons. All, uh, uh, the area was hewn, excavated from out of a large horseshoe area. The excavated rock around the Sphinx enclosure has been proven by geologists on site to be the 200 ton blocks of the Sphinx and the Valley Temples itself. Thus, the area surrounding the mass of limestone that became the Sphinx statue 240 foot long, 66 feet high, is the quarry itself used to, used to material the adjacent temples, proving as the authors Hancock and Bovell wrote in The Message of the Sphinx 
that the Sphinx and Valley Temples were built at the exact same time. They wrote, what we may be looking at here are the fingerprints of a highly sophisticated and perhaps technological people capable of awe-inspiring architectural and engineering feats at a time when no civilization of any kind is supposed to have existed anywhere on Earth. The Temple of the Sphinx is also called the Granite Temple and it was uncovered in 1853 for the first time by French archaeologist Auguste Mariette. Scholars are convinced that its unusual cyclopean masonry and complete lack of hieroglyphs confirmed its immense antiquity. Here at Giza, near the foot of the Great Pyramid, was a mysterious structure that during the entire age of the pharaohs was underground and unknown to the Egyptians. The Egyptian Antiquities Authority officially began with Viceroy Said Pasha's appointment of Frenchman Auguste Mariette to head the service. The authority put an end to all unauthorized excavations. This year, 1857, began the academic and political campaign to search only for evidence of an Egyptian indigenous origin of the anomalies throughout Egypt rather than of a much older pre-Egyptian civilization. Egyptology is a science of censorship. The Temple of the Sphinx is absolutely devoid of hieroglyphs. The Valley Temple next to the Sphinx has no inscriptions of any kind, and the giant blocks are perfectly fitted together in a curious jigsaw pattern interlocking the blocks. It is also called the Upper Temple at Giza and contains colossal stones weighing up to 468 tons. The Valley Temple has a precision cut technolithic corner block fitted only into two walls, a most unusual architectural feature found in the later Heliolithic buildings at Machu Picchu in South American Peru and in other sites throughout the Urumbaba Valley of South America. The Valley Temple and Sphinx Temple, attached by a causeway to the middle pyramid of the three great pyramids, is entirely misdirection. Homo Anuna, in the pre-cataclysm world, in secret constructed the Great Pyramid with its interior ascendant corridors, its galleries and chambers, the King's Chamber, the sarcophagus, the shafts, without, without mankind knowing of their existence. We will return to this in a moment. In 1902, the buried megalithic temple complex called the Osirion, this is the third structure found beneath Egypt's sands in this study. The Osirion was discovered by Sir Flinders Petrie and Margaret Alice Murray. Its floor located 40 feet below ground level, a massive complex of red granite in a deep swamp. Its blocks were 60 tons and more, a temple 100 feet long and 60 feet wide, the enclosure wall being 20 feet thick. thick. Again, I say temple only because that's what the official, the official moniker is. We don't know what these structures are. We just know that there are three structures built of blocks we can barely move today that were buried underground that most of Egyptian history passed by unnoticed. The beautiful masonry of quartzite, red limestone, the, the almost invisible joints, the seams that can barely be seen, the megalithic architecture, many archaeologists have come to the conclusion that the Osirion at Abydos that was found underground is identical to both the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple at the foot of the Great Pyramid. While the Osirion at Abydos is of unknown antiquity, it does date to the same period of the construction at Giza. It is constructed of immense blocks of gigantic posts, blocks being 15 feet long, and its construction parallels that of the Sphinx Temple. In 1912 and 1914, the archaeologist Naville also noticed that the Osirion was similar to the Valley Temple at Giza. He published data showing architectural similarities between the Osirion at Abydos and the Temple of the Sphinx at Giza. On some of the megalithic blocks was a thick knob, a feature noted by David Hatcher Childers to be found on the Great Stone Blocks also at Cuzco in South America. Childress wrote that the architecture of the Osirion is completely different from anything Egyptian. Pharaoh Seti I of the 19th dynasty built his own temple at, 
at, uh, of Osiris at Abydos, right next to the much older and impressive Osirion structure called the Tomb of Osiris by the ancient Egyptians who found the building. In his inscriptions, Seti I never claimed to have built the Osirion. However, Egyptologists desperate for an explanation to this anomalous structure have always posited or inferred without evidence that Seti was the builder. These three temples are devoid of hieroglyphics because Egyptian hieroglyphics when they were constructed did not yet exist. There is no evidence nor proof of the existence of hieroglyphic writing in Egypt until after 1899 BC. And this is proto-hieroglyphic writing, which was very remarkably similar to early Sumerian pictographic writing. All of the artifacts, like the Narmer steel, assigned to 3100 BC, are done so arbitrarily simply because Egyptologists need to create a formative period when Egyptians had to learn pyramid and temple construction in order to convince themselves and the world that the monuments of high antiquity found in their country today are of Egyptian origin and not the relics of a pre-Egyptian civilization. The research of Samuel Noah Kramer on the Sumerian and the associations to early Egyptian will be the, the subject matter of a future video. That I promise. The focus of the Giza site temples, the causeways, lesser pyramids, and sphinx geometrically is clearly the middle pyramid. The second of the two great pyramids, so much misdirection was employed that even the subterranean levels reinforce the importance of the middle pyramid, which is of lesser height, though built upon a platform, and it is much shorter than the great pyramid, but you can't tell when you look at it, it's an optical illusion. The Middle Pyramid has none of the refinement of the Great Pyramid. It is inferior construction and has no ascendant passages, no grand gallery, no queen's chamber, no antechamber, no, no king's chamber, no upward shafts, and is merely the most perfect typecast pyramid known to the ancients in both hemispheres. People who never once attempted to build a structure to mimic the Great Pyramid's unique upper features simply because, just like the three buried underground temples, Nothing was ever known about them until the Muslims in the year 820 AD tunneled into the Great Pyramid and accidentally found them. Campbell's Shaft is a 15-foot square pit that descends about 100 feet on the Giza, Giza Plateau located between the Sphinx and the Second Pyramid. Again, deliberate deception is intended to mislead later generations into believing in the importance of the Second Pyramid. The entire Giza complex has a geometrical focus not on the Great Pyramid, but on the Second Inferior Pyramid. The Great Pyramid is to the perimeter of the entire complex and given the impression that it is merely a part of the whole, ancillary, rather than the most important part. Clever misdirection. Men were never intended to know of its true interior. Imagine the greatest structure in all of Egypt, far away from the most ancient Egyptian metropolis cities, far from the Valley of the Kings where its pharaohs were buried, not built by the Egyptians at all. Blasphemy, they say. A desert full of dullards. They're all mistaking mirages for history. But misdirection was employed inside the Great Pyramid as well. The empty sarcophagus in the king's chamber was a bit of genius. A successful tactic to induce its discoverers to conclude that the chamber was for a burial. Hence the monument it was merely an elaborate sepulcher. Zechariah Sitchin has found some internal misdirection as well. The mysterious shaft connecting the lower end of the Grand Gallery to the lower end of the descending passage was an original part of the construction. Like the whole layout of the exterior of the Giza monuments, it was architectural misdirection. This well shaft is about 200 feet, twisting and turning in seven distinct segments. Most of its length is a uniform 28 inch bore, but over 37 centuries its existence was unknown because of the indigenous ceiling blocks, the excuse me, the ingenious ceiling blocks in the descending passage that had concealed it. This shaft was not discovered until the year 820 when the Caliph of Baghdad, Al Mamon, tunneled past the newly discovered granite plugs of the ascendant passage to enter a grand gallery covered in fine white powder. The Muslims found the tunnel, and they, they found the shaft, 
and they lowered themselves all the way to the descending passage by busting through the hidden ceiling block from above. Again, Zechariah Sitchin, he cites evidence that the shaft was bored downward from the Grand Gallery and stopped, and likewise, it was bored upward from the descending passage and also stopped short of connecting to the upper bore. The clever ceiling block was in place to hide the lower bore. The Great Pyramid was complete. The upper infrastructure was absolutely concealed. But the upper and lower bored shafts terminated several feet from each other. Sitchin claims accurately that the unbored rough and irregular section connecting the two board shafts was tunneled through after the pyramid was complete and the upper tunnels and chambers were completely sealed off from the descending passage, hidden from discovery. A wedge-like ramp stone originally concealed the upper shaft entrance to the Grand Gallery, but the Arabs in 820 found only a gaping hole, the gallery covered in fine white dust. Sitchin cites references claiming that the ramp was blown outward by someone ascending through the board shafts after they were connected. Zechariah Sitchin, Sitchin's penchant for absolute genius and vision is re, in reconstructing archaic puzzle pieces is again overshadowed by his profoundly stupid, insupportable position that the god Marduk was imprisoned inside the Great Pyramid and the concealed shafts were used and tunneled together to rescue him. It is, it, it's so ridiculous that sometimes I have to reread the passages in Sitchin's books to make sure that this, this man of genius actually said this and believed it. it, it's, uh, it I have to suspend my disbelief. For these hidden shafts to be a part of the original construction executed between 2905 and 2815 BC, then it was the original plan to enter the ascending passage, Grand Gallery, Queen's and King's Chambers in secrecy for the act of removing materials after construction was complete. Materials that were not present when the Muslims explored the upper interior of the Great Pyramid 37 centuries later. The first humans to ever enter those passages and chambers since the unidentified materials were removed. So we have the technolithic precision architecture of the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is not reflected in the two other pyramids and the small lesser pyramids, but it is matched in the three temples or whatever these structures are found in Egypt underground that are devoid of hieroglyphics. So what materials were removed? We have already covered in prior videos that the Great Pyramid was an engine it has an engineering function. It was a facility Welcome to the seventh video in Giza Secrets Revealed series. It is the position of Archaic's research that the architects of the Great Pyramid encoded a holographic template of our reality. That the numbers, the arithmetic that governs our reality tunnels is preserved perfectly. All the physics constants that we know and that we have discovered are found in the three-dimensional geometry of the internal arrangements of the Great Pyramid. It is also the position of the Archaic's research that the rest of the Giza complex is all deceit. That every bit of it, from the second pyramid, the third smaller pyramid, all three causeways, the two temples, and the Sphinx itself is all misdirection. Every bit of it is to detract and take away from the focus, which is the Great Pyramid of Egypt. The only pyramid in the world like it. The rest of Giza is of inferior architecture. The technolithic precision of the Great Pyramid is unmatched anywhere else in the entire world. It is an enigma wrapped in so many mysteries that we're still trying to penetrate the interior. The knowledge about the Great Pyramid it is vacant. There are thousands of YouTube videos and hundreds of thousands of articles and posts and books in many languages of the world from many time periods about the Great Pyramid. Nothing else in history has ever been studied so much. And yet, only in this series of videos have you seen the template. 138 in its multiples and in several different dimensions. 
divided and multiplied by phi and pi. 138 is found everywhere. It's the Great Pyramid screams it out. And the only correlate that we have in history is the orbit of the Phoenix. Every 138 years, this phenomenon occurs. It is linked to floods. It is linked to great disasters. It is linked to whole populations of people vanishing. It is linked to plagues. It is linked to mud falling out of the sky and burying entire cities. It is linked to so many different mysteries of the ancient world, and yet so far, outside of the archaics context, no one has put a synthetic history together that explains all these anomalies. In this video, we will begin wrapping up our study of the Great Pyramid. This is more evidence of the deceit in the design of the Giza complex. Continental Europe and Asia, Australia, the continents of Africa, and North America all share a common characteristic largely unknown to antiquarians. Except for the Great Pyramid Complex at Giza and the Osirion at Abydos, both in Egypt, there are no pre-cataclysm structures found above the ground. The cataclysm in reference here is the 2239 B.C. Great Deluge so common in the records of antiquity. All of the ancient walls, citadels, mound defense systems, canal works, and stone city cities spread across these continents were erected by post-technolithic engineers after this cataclysm or by Heliolithic builders from 1899 BC to about 1650 BC. And the reason for this is that almost the entire Old Bronze Age was completely buried in hundreds of feet of mud. Britain, not a part of the continent, boasts of one technolithic structure in that of Stonehenge I, an antediluvian chronolithic calendar. A whole entire video will be dedicated to this in the future. The interior of the island of Britain, called Ancient Albion, was little affected by the flood disaster. There are about 60 underground cities, each having numerous sublevels and precision board air shafts of technolithic design beneath the surface of Turkey. Hittite inscriptions and art on the first couple of levels reveals that they did not build these subterranean cities, but had found them and only occupied the, close to, the closest levels that were to the surface. These underground cities have been found all around the world in tunnels connected to them. There were fallout shelters, much like Phoenix Hill in China, which, is, which has been the subject of other YouTube videos and several posts, articles, and books around the world. One continent stands out as having technolithic archaeological remains deep in its underground, spread across its surface, and at the highest altitudes of its mountains, South America, in the opposite hemisphere from Giza. Antiquarian James O'Conn coined the term technolithic. Technolithic civilization employed scalar boring, quarrying, levitation, and the transportation of, of great blocks through the air. Homo and Nuna, employing cerebral interface technologies, were able to tunnel out and excavate whole underground cities, bases connecting subterranean roads and accesses, ventila ventilation shafts through thousands of feet of bedrock, and raise laser precision monuments comprised of millions of separate lithic components like the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is actually a gigantic stone machine. A chief accomplishment of this technolithic civilization was the use of synthetic stone for building materials, geopolymers, in the Great Pyramid that had until recently not been discovered. Over 60 underground cities have been found in Turkey, Asia Minor, and the corridors underground that connect them are all similar to those found everywhere beneath South America. Technolithic examples of architecture in vast areas of shaped rock show evidence of people practicing with these technologies. The Phoenix Transit and Cataclysms of May 1687 B.C. thoroughly broke apart the basement rock of the Andes Mountains, thrusting South American cities like Tiahuanacu over 12,000 feet above sea level, a city that just moments before the upheaval had been a port. 
The books of David Hatcher Childress and others have greatly examined the historical findings of a vast network of underground tunnels in South America, precision cut and older than the native populations who have absolutely no recollect recollection of, of these tunnels. There are no technolithic architectural remains anywhere in the lands of Sumer, Akkad, Babylonia, Assyria, the whole of the Near East, the Levant, the entire Mediterranean, and none to be found anywhere in continental Europe or Central Asia. The Great Pyramid of Giza is entirely technolithic, as is Puma Punca in Bolivia, South America, and Stonehenge in Southern Britain. There are hundreds of examples of post-technolithic structures and practice molds found all over South America, demonstrating that the techno technology had been passed on, but not the technical skill of how to use it. 99% of all the megalithic structures found around the world are post-technolithic. This is 2647 through 2239 BC and Heliolithic, which is 2239 BC cataclysm date to 1687 BC, the next Phoenix cataclysm. Technolithic architecture dates strictly to the contact period. This contact period is in reference to Homo Anuna and its bestowing ordinary humans with civilization. Between 3439 and 2647 BC, a 792 year period that Homo Anuna were present on Earth among Homo sapiens. Technolithic architecture was devoid of stylized facing, all utilitarian 90 degree angles, very smooth plane surfaces, precise austere. It was after this great deluge that the descendants of Homo Anuna from before the cataclysm called now the Heliolithic culture of the Old Bronze Age, the Shimsu Hor, or Children of the Sun, famous in antiquity, adorned every facade of every structure with reliefs, artistic expressionism of humans long after the contact with Homo Anuna was broken. The Great Pyramid was built by Homo Anuna from 2905 to 2815 BC. No humans were involved. After it was completed, humans were trained and allowed to aid in the construction of the Second Pyramid, which is connected by a causeway to the Sphinx, a dog-human hybrid representing the domestication of humankind that was later arbitrarily altered into a Heliolithic lion image. Men learn pyramid building, but the second pyramid and then the third pyramid are much inferior in their construction. Trained to use Anunnaki technology, humans were not nearly as skilled. The Great Pyramid is truly unique of all pyramids. Not only was its 51.51 .51 degree angle never replicated, but its construction was precise and has never been matched. The epitome of technolithic engineering. Additionally, while hundreds of pyramids around the world all have subterranean tunnels leading to chambers below the structures, and some even to well shafts resembling the Great Pyramid, only the Great Pyramid of Giza has ascending passages and chambers and a grand gallery and star shafts. No other pyramids in the entire world replicated these fe features because humans of the post-technolithic period and Heliolithic period did not know they existed. Homo Anuna sealed off access to the ascendant passages and chambers of the Great Pyramid by a cleverly concealed granite plug system disguised as a ceiling block like, I like any other in the descendant passage. Humans crawled into the depths of the subterranean chamber during the Old and Late Bronze Age period, the whole duration of Egyptian civilization. The entire length of the Roman monarchy, the Roman Republic, and then the Roman Empire, and never did mankind discover the hidden entrance until Al Mamon tunneled into the Great Pyramid in the year 820 of Common Era, when his men accidentally shook loose the concealed ceiling block with all of their hammering in another area 36 centuries after it was sealed. The second and third pyramids at Giza only have descending passages and chambers because they did not know that the Great Pyramid had been constructed with ascendant passages and chambers, a grand gallery, and shafts. In this way, Homo Anuna protected the secret of the interior of the Great Pyramid. Humans were deliberately involved in the construction projects of the second and the third pyramids to safeguard the secret. 
This is why hundreds of pyramids found around the world in both the Old and New World all have descending passages leading down to underground chambers or caves. Homo and Nuna added the ultimate architectural piece of misdirection, the sarcophagus. In the event that humans ever did find their way into the upper interior of the edifice, the sarcophagus was placed to give them an explanation for the monument, a burial, though no body was ever interred. When directed what to believe, humans would not search for the actual engineering function of the structure that the monument served as some sort of facility that performed a specific function cannot be doubted. Anyone who has seen the inside of the Grand Gallery with its precision niches and overlapping wall surfaces can easily ascertain that something large moved up and down that gr the Grand Gallery and with great rapidity. The rituals and ceremonies carried out blindly by the ancient Egyptians are not known today. Masonic degrees may or may not have derived from the older mystery schools. Masonry, if at all, preser preserves practices of antiquity only in pieces. What Homo sapiens observed of Homo Anuna's activities was definitely not of esoteric doings. The precision, permanence, and immensity of this 41-story edifice called the Great Pyramid is evidence of an important function. The precision-aligned observation shafts infer that this function could only occur at a specific time of year, meaning whatever was occurring inside the pyramid happened only when the northern hemisphere was facing a certain region of the sky. Homo Anuna may have harnessed a technology allowing for the drawing, storing, and transference of directed energy into orbit to power vessels or as so many believe today, the technology functioned as a teleport transdimensional station only when Earth was in position. Perhaps the kings and queens chambers were sending and receiving ports for interplanetary dimensional materials, cargoes. There is evidence of high energy presence in the king's chamber. Sir Flinders Petrie, scientific analysis of the king's chamber found that the room of stone had been subject to a violent internal disturbance that had shaken it so badly that the entire chamber had expanded by an inch. Engineer Christopher Dunn notes that this immense pressure only affected the king's chamber. The pyramid texts are thousands of verses combined into hundreds of utterances embossed or painted in hieroglyphic writing of ancient Egypt on the walls, passages, and chambers of the pyramids of the five pharaohs, Unas, Teti, Pepi I, Menenra, and Pepi II. The pyramid texts preserve the great lie of Homo Anuna. Sitchin wrote that the texts were taken together describe a journey to a realm that begins above ground, the Giza complex, that leads underground the descendant passages of pyramids, that ends with an opening to the skies through which the gods were launched heavenward. The Anuna geniuses had humans help them build the second and third pyramids knowing their misinformation would be replicated. The secret of the existence of the Ascendant Passage in King's Chamber was unknown to all pyramid-building cultures. The false pyramid with only a Descendant Passage was copied by all civilizations exhausting themselves in the attempt to build a pyramid satisfactory enough to bridge heaven and earth to induce the return of the gods, the Anuna. Zechariah Sitchin notes that the pyramid text hieroglyphic connotation combined the concept of a subterranean place with a celestial function. Humans were given a puzzle they were meant to figure out but were not given all of its components. These texts concern the operation of the ladder of the sky a stairway to heaven, a concept that is repeated in the Book of the Dead, but the ideas of the pyramid texts were vague because the Egyptians themselves were preserving a concept for which they possessed no technical knowledge. Scholar J. H. Breasted wrote of the pyramid texts that these texts abound in pictures from a long vanished world of which they were but a mere reflection. The placement of the Sphinx before the second pyramid, which appears to be of equal height, but is actually had been erected on an elevated platform. The causeway connecting the Sphinx enclosure to the second pyramid and not the Great Pyramid, and the layout of the entire Giza complex is an elaborately planned deception designed to draw attention away from the Great Pyramid, to visually lessen its importance 
to invoke the perception that it is but a part of a whole rather than the hidden truth, that it is the central secret of the Anunnaki technology. For this reason, the Sphinx requires a bit more of our attention.